Bienvenidos a la noche cósmica de la oveja eléctrica, aquí en Canal 22, en donde hoy vamos a hablar del poder terapéutico de la poesía. En la emisión anterior, conversamos con el destacado psiquiatra Norman Rosenthal, investigador del Instituto Nacional de Salud Mental en Estados Unidos, sobre la poesía como una herramienta más dentro del arsenal de prescripciones médicas que él utiliza para enfrentar la depresión y nuestras heridas. En la segunda y última parte de esta interesante conversación, el doctor Norman Rosenthal nos adentra en su consultorio y nos muestra cómo es que utiliza los recursos de los poemas cuando atiende a sus pacientes. Se supone que la poesía no persigue ningún fin utilitario, pero resulta que la agudeza y belleza de la observación poética tiene efectos colaterales benéficos. Las investigaciones científicas muestran que las experiencias de trascendencia de nuestros límites usuales, esta experiencia que se puede dar en la poesía, afecta al cerebro, a nuestra respiración y al ritmo cardíaco. Let's talk about the healing power of these uh, poems in your practice. How it happens. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Um, you know, oftentimes a couple will come to me and they'll be fighting, you know. He did this, well, she did that. And, and they turn to me like I'm a judge. I'm supposed to give a verdict and I'm supposed to give a sentence and the wrong one's got to be punished and the right one will be vindicated. Well, that's not my job, I tell them. I'm here to help you come together. I'm here to help you find out why did you love each other in the first place and how can you bury your anger towards each other and find the joy that you once experienced. So sometimes it doesn't work and I say, well, may I, may I share a poem with you? And they get a little surprised because, you know, <laughs> that this is not on the script. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. I say, all right, here's Rumi. Beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When you lie there in the long grass, language, ideas, even the phrase each other doesn't have, make any sense. So, uh, and then they sort of, well, this is not, what is this all about? So we start to talk, you know, what is it all about? Well, are we going to worry about who's right and who's wrong? Or are we going to lie down in the long grass together? The poet reaches out his hand. He says, I'll meet you there. He makes the first move. Okay, who's going to make the first move? And say, I'll meet you there. Shake my hand. Give me a kiss. Let me hug you. Who's going to do that? And start a different conversation. The conversation of what do you share? What brings you to What still gives you joy? instead of who's right and who's wrong. That's beautiful. One of my friends took that poem and stuck it on his fridge oh. just to remind him. <laughs> you know, you also wrote a book called Transcendence. How does poetry relate to transcendence? You explore a poem by William Wordsworth, Tintern Abbey. Yes, yes. Well, transcendence, for those of us who meditate, will understand that it is an experience of consciousness that's different from ordinary waking or sleeping or dreaming. It is a state where one goes into a space that's almost like an enchanted forest. It's a space where there is great purity and ease and emptiness in the best sense of the word. But then all of a sudden, a certain liveliness comes into play. And um, Tintern Abbey is a wonderful poem, but if I might just mention another poem of Wordsworth, because Wordsworth was a deeply transcendental man. He really got it, and he was able to use words to recreate it, which is part of his magic, and why all these hundreds of years later we admire him so much. In the poem, Daffodils, he starts... I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or veils and hills. So you see the 
floaty feeling of the transcendence. And then when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So here is the transcendent, the floaty feeling and the radiant, vibrating, sparkling feeling all coming together. In Tintern Abbey, he comes back to a place that he has visited five years before. And entranced by being in that same place, he remembers that previous experience of transcendence. And all the time in between, what this transcendence has done for him in dark rooms, in his, presumably in his office, there have been a memory uh, like small unremembered acts of kindness and he feels it in his body almost like he can feel it in his heart and his blood and everything seems to stand still all the stress all the trauma of the busy life of the city comes to a halt as he thinks back to the state of consciousness previously induced by Tintern Abbey the same situation where he is now it's a very great poem and it's, it normally would be difficult, but I've taken it and after thinking about it a lot, deconstructed it and shown you how he makes his magic happen. And you know, this is very difficult uh, balancing act because uh, uh, to translate poetry without being condescending, it's, it's a fit. Yes, well, thank you. I hope I've succeeded. El doctor Norman Rosenthal es autor del libro titulado Receta Poética, 50 inspiradores poemas que pueden sanar y traer gozo a tu vida. En este libro analiza con inteligencia y respeto el mundo encantado que se puede revelar en la poesía. Recuerdo unos versos del gran poeta mexicano Carlos Pellicer que le canta al río Sumacinta mientras se sueña como parte del paisaje. Dice Pellicer, yo era un gran árbol tropical. En mi cabeza tuve pájaros. Sobre mis piernas, un jaguar. Escribe Pellicer desde ese lugar donde se integra todo. Mirando el río de aquellas tardes, junté las manos para beberlo. Por mi garganta pasaba un ave, pasaba el cielo. Mirando el río di poca sombra. Todo era mío. Todas pintadas jamás extintas, son estas aguas, río de monos, Usumacinta. En tu grandeza, con esplendores reconfortaste, sabia y tristeza. En un parpadeo cósmico volvemos a la oveja eléctrica para asomarnos con el destacado investigador Norman Rosenthal al placer poético y su efecto reparador en la fisiología. de rayo con tintes verdes y dorados que aparecen con la danza de las palabras, estamos de regreso en la noche cósmica de la oveja eléctrica aquí en Canal 22. Estamos conversando con el doctor Norman Rosenthal, un destacado psiquiatra y escritor que nos habla sobre el poder terapéutico de la poesía, sobre el repentino brote de esperanza que surge con la percepción de lo sutil como una bendición, de la música de las palabras, de la música y ritmos de la naturaleza, que masajean a nuestros cuerpos y suspenden, literalmente, nuestro aliento. And, you know, uh, when we are, you're talking about this blessed mood uh, that uh, Wordsworth de describes, uh, this can take us again to the relationship between poetry and respiration that has been the subject of reflection by several poets. In El Arco y la Lira, The Bow and the Lyre, the Mexican poet Octavio Paz recalls that Etiamble maintains that poetic pleasure could have a physiological, muscular, and respiratory origin. There is a kind of massage by the metrics and music of words. Octavio Paz says that reciting verses 
It's like dancing with the movement of our body and nature. Let's talk about that effect in body, but also with nature. Well, I think nature has got this amazing ability to bring out all kinds of things in us. For example, there's the wonderful poem by uh, Thomas Hardy called The Darkling Thrush. He's standing by a gate at the end of the 19th century. And it's a dark day and he's down and you can feel the heaviness in his body and in his mind. And he just sees nothing but dreariness and gloom and grim future ahead of him as he looks at the beginning of the 20th century. And all of a sudden, an aged thrush, frail, gaunt and small in blast beruffled plume, comes out with this glorious note that the thrush gives out. And here he is saying, wow, you know, does he know some reason for hope that I don't know about? Is this a sign from nature to tell me that there's something to hope for, even though I'm feeling so gloomy? And it's the genius of a poet, because as I say in the book, somebody else would come into the house and say, you know, I was standing against the gate. It was really a bad day. I was feeling dreadful, but how about a cup of tea? And here we are with this genius 150 years later with this masterpiece that recreates the sudden burst of hope at hearing the sound of a bird singing. Oh, uh, you know, uh... And this comes about by reciting them, reciting verses aloud. What's the effect of reciting verses, not just reading them? Because this burst of joy maybe gets amplified while you recite them. Such a good point. I thoroughly encourage my readers to recite them aloud because it's like suddenly you are occupying the body of the poet. You're taking on the same thoughts that he or she had when writing the poem. And so you feel it. Even these small verses that I've recited now, I feel the poems when I recite them. So please, I have presented all these poems here and I've actually given people a guide how to recite this or how to listen. Some of these poets have actually got their poems read. The, the brilliant sonneteer, Edna St. Vincent Millay, has a wonderful sonnet that she's read called Pity Me Not. Pity me not because of the light of day, at close of day no longer walks the sky. And she tells you all these ordinary things that happen to everybody for which she asks for no pity. But at the end, she said, pity me that the heart is slow to learn what the swift mind beholds at every turn. So she has been clever in the mind, but foolish in the heart. How many of us can confess that that has happened during the course of our lifetime? <laughs> Es interesante saber que una de las pacientes del doctor Norman Rosenthal le dijo que ese poema había sido particularmente valioso. Ella sufría de problemas en sus relaciones románticas. Al principio las sentía maravillosas, pero después invariablemente se deterioraban. Sin embargo, ese soneto le hablaba a ella, le daba perspectiva. Todas las cosas se van, la luz del día, la belleza del verano, la luna llena y las mareas menguantes. Entiende entonces que la vida y el amor siempre involucran riesgos a los que todos somos vulnerables. Pero también entiende que lo único por lo cual podría ser compadecida es porque su corazón y su veloz mente no están en sintonía. Eso le dio luz sobre lo que realmente necesitaba en su terapia. En un parpadeo cósmico, Volvemos a la oveja eléctrica para seguir conversando con el doctor Norman Rosenthal 
sobre el efecto que puede tener la poesía en nuestras vidas cuando la desmitificamos y nos damos cuenta de que no se trata de un ornato, sino de una marea rítmica que nos conecta con la vida. Como de rayo con tintes verdes y dorados, como los que se experimentan en los versos más antiguos y entrañables, estamos de regreso en la noche cósmica de la oveja eléctrica, aquí en Canal 22. Estamos conversando con el destacado psiquiatra Norman Rosenthal, quien fue pionero en el estudio de los trastornos afectivos estacionales, como los que se dan con la oscuridad y tristeza que trae el invierno. En la primera parte de esta charla, hablamos de un estudio que apareció en la revista Scientific American, que planteaba que recitar los versos de la Odisea de Homero mejoraba la actividad cardiovascular y que podía tener un efecto épico en la salud. Para ello, se necesita ir más allá de los lugares comunes para entender y gozar la poesía. That, that means that poetry can give us insight into very subtle realms of reality that expands our vision. And this dismitifies what poetry is, because many people think that it's just an ornament or a, a game of, of sounds and rhymes that supposedly only a few can understand. Let's talk about uh, this effect that you also try to reach with your book, to dismitify the poetic experience and to show that It's for everybody. Well, yes, I think, I think poetry goes wherever the human heart goes. And poetry goes wherever the mind goes. There was another very interesting experience that I had when I first treated the people with seasonal affective disorder with light. And a woman who had been completely desolate, almost paralyzed with her depression, was started on the bright light and came into the unit where I was working at the National Institute of Mental Health and she was radiant and she said I feel wonderful what is this what have you what have you done what is this thing doing and I realized that this was really I, I was seeing the law of nature unfold it's like somebody who's watching the sunrise for the first time and then I thought of the poem by John Keats on first reading Chapman's Homer. He was reading a new translation of, Ch of Homer, just what you started this talk with. People should read the Homer every day. Um, and uh, he was reading the translation that brought it alive for him. And he felt the thrill of discovery. And he thought about the astronomer Herschel, who was living around that time, when he first saw a new planet gliding into the sights in his telescope, the planet Uranus. Uh, and he thought of the conquistadors when they first saw the Pacific Ocean. And the, the people stared at them in what he calls a wild surmise. So there I was seeing something brand new and feeling the thrill of seeing something as it were for the first time and all the nurses were around and I, I say in my book they they said I don't know about wild surmise but they certainly seemed really happy that everything was turning out as planned. You know you treated a seasonal affective disorder with physical light but you also treat um, pain and suffering with the light of words and uh, you say that uh, words poetry can be a medicine for the mind. Uh, this, this happened yes. to John Stuart Mill while reading Wordsworth poetry. Yes, he writes about it. This was a man, the philosopher of the early 19th century, John Stuart Mill. He had been hyper-educated from when he was a little boy. What I mean by hyper-educated is I doubt whether he had many toys. His father, seeing that he had 
had a brilliant son, was determined to turn him into a sort of genius, which in fact he was, and started, he, he learned Greek, I think, at age three, classical Greek, although he was an Englishman. So his head had been stuffed with facts from early on and stuffed with material. And contrast that with Wordsworth, who talks about how in his childhood, but he ran around the hills and ran across the, uh, uh, you, you know, the hills, the swamps, in the lakes, everywhere, and how his childhood was filled with the wonder of nature. So he didn't get that kind of hyper intellectual education. And Stuart Mill now was grown up and he was depressed. You know, he didn't see how all of his philosophy could lead him to relief from this depression. And then he began began to read the poetry of Wordsworth. And he said it was not just the poetry itself that brought him out of his depression, but reading about how Wordsworth processed these scenes of nature, just what we've been talking about, the daffodils, Tim Turn Abbey, how he had responded with his emotional brain. And that, said Stuart Mill, brought him out of his depression from which he never descended again. He stayed well through the rest of his life. Uh, a brilliant example of the curing power of words. Or the words worth. Medicine of mind. Normal Rosenthal, thank you very much for your presence in Channel 22. As you have showed us, poetry can lower maybe blood pressure and massage the muscles of the body and the heart. But in this prescription, there is no loss the minimum effect would be to meet again with art and beauty. Thank you, thank you very much. But thank you so much for this very sensitive and beautiful interview. I appreciate it. Thank you. You know, I, I, at, at last, uh, uh, one, one thing that is very interesting is how you have in, this, in your memory all this, all this poetry. Uh, and you know, George Steiner would say that uh, uh, the, the, the lines of the books can remain in the books, but if you memorize them, they, they are in your physiology. They are very near to your heart. I have lived with these poems for a long time. And during the pandemic, they were my best friends. So I have, um, I've enjoyed them very much. And at the end of the book, I say that what they've been to me Firstly, they've been like shining jewels, casting colors on the walls of the room. But second, they've been like oil lamps, illuminating the inner spaces of the mind. So they have been also messengers of people who thought and felt very deeply across the ages from other lands. So uh, these are friends by now. La buena literatura, la poesía, nos puede hacer ver cosas que hemos visto miles de veces como si las viéramos por vez primera. Los poemas, nos dice el doctor Norman Rosenthal, son como lámparas de aceite que iluminan los espacios interiores de la mente, sobre todo en tiempos difíciles, en tiempos de pandemia, en donde la apertura de la percepción y el descubrimiento de la belleza se vuelven parte fundamental de nuestra capacidad de resistencia y amor por la vida. Un honor contar con la presencia del doctor Norman Rosenthal aquí en La Oveja Eléctrica. Y bueno, pasamos ahora con la sonrisa de la música, que es poesía en movimiento, con los cantos cuánticos de nuestro queridísimo Fernando Rivera Calderón. Querido Fernando Rivera Calderón, estoy desde una galaxia muy lejana tratando de hacer contacto contigo. ¿Qué onda? ¿Eres? Hola, Pepe. Este, no, no supe en qué momento te volviste corcolito o Pepe Grillo, pero bueno, este, qué bueno que estás por ahí. Sí, estoy por ahí. <risa> Realmente estoy tratando de comunicarme contigo. Ah, ya, a través ya te de vi, ya, ya, ya apareciste. ¿Qué onda, Pepe? Ya, oye, me estaban Ay. asustando, ya, ya creí que estaba este, teniendo un contacto paranormal. Es que estoy eh, a través de un agujero de gusano que es un túnel cósmico tratando de comunicarme contigo desde el mismo paisaje cósmico pero a millones de años luz. 
wow. desde otros espacios de este mismo escenario. Y la verdad es muy emocionante estar haciendo contacto contigo, porque hoy, mi querido Fer, vamos a hablar de la búsqueda de la belleza, esa búsqueda que a veces parece ser un fin en sí mismo y que nos lleva, en ese caso, algo que no es lo más eh, eh, apreciable, ¿no? No, bueno, cuántas locuras no hemos cometido los seres humanos en pos de la belleza. Y, y si bien decía este gran pensador Luis Ríos que no se puede vivir como si la belleza no existiese, sin duda hacer el ejercicio de un mundo donde no hubiera este asombro eh, que, que, que es nuestra debilidad, bueno, por, por lo menos les propongo que lo imaginemos con esta canción. Si solo nos gustara lo fácil, lo feo, lo que causa pereza, la vida no sería tan difícil. Ah, pero nos gusta la belleza, la belleza nos hace sufrir, la belleza nos hace llorar, la belleza nos hace sentir que este mundo puede mejorar, pero no es la belleza un trofeo, y a su lado lo feo es más feo, muchos pierden certeza y cabeza por un instante de belleza. Ah! 